Michael, Scott Guthrie. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Hawking, for the great introduction. And good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Microsoft Connect event here in New York. We have some great content uh, to share with you this morning, as well as some pretty awesome announcements uh, to make. You know, in addition to our in-person audience, we're also streaming this event live uh, to hundreds of thousands of developers around the world. Uh, some of these developers watching have used Microsoft uh, technologies for many years. Uh, and some have never used any Microsoft technology before. And we've got some great uh, demos and announcements today that I think will really interest all of you. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. You know, we now live in an interconnected world, you know, one where applications and solutions are built increasingly to take advantage of intelligent edge devices, things like smartphones, IoT devices, and client computers and where the apps and solutions we build are increasingly running on top of intelligent clouds. And it really has never been a better time than today to be a software developer. And our goal at Microsoft is to provide developers with a platform and tools that will make them incredibly successful. Uh, it's a mission that we've had since the very beginning of the company when Bill and uh, uh, Paul founded it. And in today's event, we're gonna walk through and demo our latest development tools and cloud platform innovations that enable this developer success in an intelligent edge, intelligent cloud world. You know, the new Microsoft has pretty much everything you need uh, for creating the next generation of software applications. Um, you know, whether you're a .NET developer uh, building a web app, or a Node or Python or Java developer on a Mac doing the same, uh, whether you're building a Windows uh, client application using C++, uh, or a C-sharp developer that's targeting iOS or Android devices, a developer building a SQL uh, solution, or a Python developer using Vim who wants to create a custom analytic, analytic solution uh, running inside a Linux VM. You know, throughout the demos and announcements that today, you're going to see how we're working to enable developers to build all of these types of great applications, regardless of which language they're written in, uh, what operating system they're developed on, uh, or what devices they target and all in a very powerful, open, productive way. Now, you know, an important part of this developer story is the development tools that we provide. You know, our mission with Visual Studio is really to provide best-in-class tools for every developer now. And we now have tools for developers who want a lightweight, code-optimized editor uh, using VS Code, as well as for those looking for a full development IDE with Visual Studio. And with Visual Studio Team Services, we now provide a full suite of developer SaaS services uh, that deliver a complete DevOps experience. And com when combined with Microsoft Azure, these tools provide a development uh, environment that really is just fantastic and offers unparalleled developer productivity. Now, you know, a lot of people watching this uh, might say, okay, you know, you're saying you can use any language or technology with this combination. Uh, and get great developer productivity. That sounds good, uh, but is it really true? And what I thought we'd do um, to get started with this keynote uh, is really show something a little maybe non-traditional for a typical Microsoft development event uh, and actually you know, really show uh, this productivity in practice and do so with a demo where we're gonna build a Node.js app uh, built and deployed using Docker into the cloud, uh, running serverless uh, code against a graph-based NoSQL database uh, we're going to develop it all on a Mac uh, and use a Linux backend to actually run the production app on. And you're going to see even you know, it, with this combination how the combination of Visual Studio and Azure you know, delivers a fantastic development experience. And here's Chris Dias uh, to kick it off and actually walk us through the demo. Here's Chris. Thanks, Scott. Uh, as Scott said, it's a, actually it's a great time to be a developer. Um, and developers, we're, we're kind of like craftsmen. And as craftsmen, we're really passionate about the tools that we, uh, that we have and use. And the tool that I'm most passionate about these days is Visual Studio Code. 
Now, Visual Studio Code is our cross-platform, lightweight, open-source development environment. And you can come here to uh, code.visualstudio.com. There's a big green button. You can just download it right away. It's about 50 meg download. Sets up and installs in under a minute. Not something you see from Microsoft every, every day. Um, but I'm not going to install a stable build. I've got something called the Insiders build installed on my machine already. Now, the Insiders build is the same build that we use to develop VS Code. It ships every single night. And what's great about it is basically the next day, you have access to new features and bug fixes, literally uh, the same ones that we do. So we're going to use that, that uh, build for this demo today. So the first thing, since uh, I'm in my tool, I want to customize it to work and feel the way that I <coughs> excuse me, work. And so right away, I'm going to change the theme to work for me. You can see built in, we have a bunch of light and dark themes that you can, uh, you can pick from, some nice Oh, there's a red one. Scott would probably like that one. Goes along with his shirt. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to come down here. You can install additional color themes. And we're going to go out to the marketplace, where the community has literally contributed hundreds and hundreds of themes that you can go and pick from. And one of the cool ones that I like recently is one by a guy named Wes Boss. And I'm going to click on Install. It's called Cobalt 2. And you get a nice little preview down here. It's pretty cool. And it's already installed. All I have to do is click on Reload, and we'll restart the tool. We'll go back to the color theme. And you can see I can set it to Cobalt. Right? So now we've got a nice theme that we can start to work with. OK. So now that we've customized the environment, I want to bring up some code and start working on that. I'm going to click on this web folder that I've been working on. And right away, what we see is we get a prompt from the tool because the workspace says, hey, you know, I've got a set of extensions that if you install those extensions, you're going to have a great experience developing this particular application. And so it, what it recommends to us is this thing called the Node Pack for Azure. And it's installing it right away. But what it is is a collection of really cool extensions for developing Node applications against Azure. It helps you get started very quickly. Um, App Service, Functions, Cosmos DB, Scott talked about Docker. That's already installed. I can just click on reload, and now we're ready to go and start programming our application. So I'm going to bring up some code now, app.js. And um, a couple things about this. Well, first off, I should say, one of the great things that VS Code does is it brings a great editing experience. The great editing experience is traditional for Microsoft and Visual Studio across platform. So one of the cool things that I can do, I love doing this. If I want to go and change a few lines of code here, I hate using let. If I can use a const, I use a const. So I can select that. I can press Command D. And I'm just going to go set <coughs> a number of cursors <coughs> excuse me, across all those lines. And I can change those to const very, very quickly. So a very rich editing experience. Um, out of the box with just plain JavaScript, I get IntelliSense against my objects that I'm using because it's driven by by the TypeScript compiler in the background, which can figure out a whole bunch of stuff about my plain JavaScript. You don't have to use TypeScript, but we use it to give you a better, richer development experience. So great editing right out of the box. So let's go, and we're going to run this application. I'm going to press F5. And what's going to happen is Node is going to start up on this machine. You can see now the app is listening on port 3000. We'll go back over to the browser. Just go to localhost 3000. And what's going to happen is our app will come up here inside the browser. And this is a, a, a Smart Hotel 360 application. Let me just take a second and explain what Smart Hotel 360 is. It's a fictitious company, a worldwide chain of, um, of hotels, and it's really trying to um, highlight the future of connected travel. And throughout this keynote this morning, you're going to see applications and demos all based on the Hotel 360 application. So in this case, what we've got is a map, and we can see different hotels that are part of the chain. And I can click on them, and I can see, hey, you know what? The sentiment for the Platinum Hotel, not very good. We could delve into that later. But the bigger problem is in this application, this chart on the left-hand side, well, it doesn't exist. There should be one there. So we want to go and figure out how we can get this to, to show up. So I'm going to go back over to VS Code. And remember, the app is still running. I haven't stopped the debugger. I can put a breakpoint here on line 19. And if I refresh the page, we're going to end up breaking back in our running application on our machine. So awesome. The second great thing about VS Code, it has a great lightweight debugger built right in. And I can do everything that you expect. I can step over, step into multi-line statements. I can hover over and see what variables are. I can set another breakpoint, and I can just press Run. And we'll run all the way down here. And we get down to the bottom where we're rendering this page. I can drill in. I get a hover tip. I can see that I've got basically a bunch of undefined objects uh, in my application. Right? Debugging is awesome. I can figure out flow control. But understanding what's going on there, sometimes I need a little bit more help. So what I could do is you know, go on to Stack Overflow or post an issue in GitHub. But um, that could take some time. And since we're in a 
keynote demo, we should probably do things a little bit faster. So what I'm going to do is switch over to Slack here, and I've got a colleague, Amanda, who uh, is awesome at uh, JavaScript. So I'm going to say, hey, Amanda, I need help now. And hopefully, whoops, help now 11, hopefully she's around. All right, she's going to be right there. So at this point, what I could do is, you know, I could do a screen sharing session with Amanda, but maybe there's stuff on my screen I don't want to share. Like, I've got email open, who knows what's in there, and I don't want to share that with her. Um, <clears throat> or, you know, there's lots of different ways I could do it. But really, you know, if you look at the history of Visual Studio and developer productivity, starting with IntelliSense and debugging, IntelliTrace and time travel debugging, we've really done a great job of sort of advancing the productivity of developers. And what I want to do now is give you a, a sneak peek at what I think is sort of the next big wave of developer productivity. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a collaborative development and debugging session with Amanda, who's remotely located. So to do that, I'm going to come down here. I'm just going to click on Share. And what this is going to do is it's going to create a connection to my workspace on my machine that I can then share with Amanda. There's a link to it. I'll go back over to Slack. And I'm going to paste this in. And now Amanda and I can start to work together. So what's awesome here is that I can just copy this link and go to my favorite uh, code editing experience, Visual Studio, and go to join, ex join collaboration session. Now that's going to pick up what's automatically on the clipboard, and I just click join. And what's happening here is that my Visual Studio, which is personalized for my use so that I'm the most productive, is actually connecting remotely to Chris's workspace, which is hosted in VS Code. And so what you see here is that we have the Solution Explorer loaded with all of his files. I can expand WebUtil, for example, and look at some other files here. Um, or I can go back to AppJS, which is, I think, where he's editing. And I can actually see that, yes, in fact, he is editing here. We see his cursor right there. There's Chris. So Chris, uh, how can I help you today? We're probably on a voice chat at this point. So uh, let me know, how can I help? All right, so Amanda, <clears throat> this loop seems to be giving me a problem. Data.tweets comes in. I've got lots of tweets and sentiment data. But I want to get down here to the render method. The sentiment with level keeps coming back with a bunch of undefined objects. I have no idea what's going on. I was hoping maybe you could help me out. So what's awesome is, obviously, as he's describing the problem to me, I'm actually seeing it be highlighted in my, my code editor. So I know exactly what he's talking about. But further, because this is actually based on a connection that's, that has the, all of the files that his code depends on on his, on his uh, machine, I can actually do things that are based on like semantic code navigation, for example. So I can go to peak definition, look up the get happiness level, and actually look at what's going on there. So I get the full kind of navigation experience that you would expect from Visual Studio uh, with this experience. All right, Chris, I, I don't yet know what's, what the problem is. Can you reproduce it for me? You bet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to say line 19. I'm going to set a breakpoint. And I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to share a debugging session with Amanda. And like we saw before, what will happen is Node will spin up on my machine. She doesn't have Node installed on her machine. I'll go back over to the browser. We'll refresh the page. And then what will happen is we'll hit the breakpoint on my machine and on her machine. So what's awesome about this is as Chris hits the breakpoint on his machine, Visual Studio is actually also hitting the breakpoint. It's the same exact debug breakpoint. Awesome? Awesome. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, further, Visual Studio actually goes into a full debug mode. So I have all of the debug windows that you would expect from Visual Studio when you were in a normal debug session. I have the locals window. I can kind of expand things, look at data, et cetera, look at the call stack. But further, because we're actually sharing the debug cursor, I can even advance the debug cursor by just going uh, step over a couple of times. And we can step over it. And I can see here that S is actually 0. OK, Chris, at this point, I know what the problem is. It's actually a rookie JavaScript mistake. So why don't you stop debugging, and I'll let you know how you can never run into this ever again. All right, let's fix that rookie mistake. I'll stop the debugger. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to the top of the file, and I'm just going to uh, take advantage of one of the features that's my favorite aspect of the fact that TypeScript is powering the JavaScript language service, which is that I can actually use the TypeScript compiler as a uh, JavaScript linter. Uh, 
So I can go ahead and just write TS check here. And even though we're in a JavaScript file, it's actually using the TypeScript compiler to do type checking on my JavaScript. And so what we see now is that I actually have a TypeScript, uh, I mean a type checking error, which is that the property sentiment doesn't exist on the type script type string. So what happens here is that you're actually you're going over an array, and if you use the let in expression over an array, then you go over all of the enumerable properties of the array object. Uh, it's kind of a weird JavaScript <sighs> idiosyncrasy. But if you use let of, so huh? if I just go ahead and edit this and change that to let of, then you'll actually see that the squiggle should go away and everything should be fixed up. So why don't you try it again? Awesome. Errors are gone on my screen as well. So, all right, let's, let's see if this works. I'll press F5. Again, we'll start up the, the uh, runtime in the debugger. We'll reload the page. And once the site comes up now, I should be able to click on one of the hotels, see the sentiment on the right, and now my chart shows up on the left. Thank you very much, Amanda. That's Appreciate that. Anytime, Chris. See you later. All right, let's go stop that debugging session. All right, now that we've got our, our front end application working, let's go deploy this thing to the cloud. And to do that, what we're going to do is use Azure App Service. Now, Azure App Service is our fully managed, hosted uh, web and API platform for, for hosting our, our web applications. What's really cool about uh, Azure App Services, you, know, you can run any sort of workload, Node, C Sharp, uh, .NET, obviously. But what I'm excited about doing today is the fact that you can actually bring your own container to Azure App Service, which me literally means you can run any type of web app on our infrastructure. You worry about your application, we'll worry about scaling it and keeping it up and all that goodness. So let's go and do that right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to my Docker file that's in my application. I'm just going to right click on it. I'm going to say Build Image. And this is contributed by that Docker extension that we installed earlier. And that creates the image. We'll go over here to our Docker extension, expand that a little bit. You can see that we've got the image now in the machine, web.latest. That's what we just created. I'm going to right click on it, and I'm going to tag it. And when I tag it, I'm basically giving it a name so that it tells Docker when we do a push, which is what we'll do right now, we'll Docker push, where to push it to. And by virtue of the fact it's the SH360 registry, this is uh, uh, an Azure Container Registry, a private Azure Container Registry that I've got for my application that I can use to put and host images up in the cloud. All right, so now that the image is now up in my private registry, I can go down in the extension again, drill into the registry. I can see the repository that we just pushed to, and there's the image. So what I'm going to do, <clears throat> you know, if I want to quickly try this out, I'm just going to right-click and deploy the image to Azure App Service. It's going to ask me a couple of questions. What's the resource group, which basically defines the application up in Azure, and it's going to ask me what the plan is. And the plan is basically the machine that it's going to run on. And you'll notice just by virtue of the name, uh, but in reality what it is, it's a Linux machine. So it's going to run our container on a Linux machine in the Azure App Service environment. And now we just need to give it a, a name that will show up on the internet. I'll say SH360 Web, and we'll uniquify it a little bit, and we'll hit Enter. So what's going to happen now is on that machine, we're going to go and provision that web application. That'll only take a second to do. And once it provisions the web application, we're going to set some properties on it. We're going to say, hey, here is the, the image and the registry to go pull from, which is what we've done here. And we've restarted the site to sort of get it going. And now we've got a link to our application hosted in the cloud. And now I can hold down Alt, click on that, and we're going to browse to the site. And what's happening now is basically it's doing a Docker pull on that machine and pulling it down. And then it'll load up the container, run it, and we should see our site here in just one second. There we go. There's our site running up in the cloud. We click on it. We can see we've got the fix uh, for the application that Amanda helped us out with earlier. So that's awesome. That's kind of the front end of the application. We got that deployed to the cloud. Let's go look at what's going on on the back end of the application. Now, what we do in this app is when tweets come in, we basically pull them off the wire and we persist them in Azure Cosmos DB. Now, Azure Cosmos DB is our fully managed, globally distributed, highly scalable NoSQL database in the cloud. And what we do is we come in and we, we pull them into a document database. And using the Cosmos DB extension, I can drill down in here. There's my tweets database, my tweets collection. And here are all the tweets that we've collected over time. You can see kudos to Platinum Hotel, things like that. 
So this is how we can and, you know, store our data. And Cosmos is a great solution for this problem because as more hotels come online worldwide, Cosmos will provide me turnkey data replication worldwide just by clicking a couple checkboxes, guaranteed throughput, and very, very fast or low latency. So it's going to scale with my application. But not only do we sort of pull the tweets in, we do some analysis and processing on these tweets once we get them. And to do that, we actually use a serverless Azure function. And a serverless Azure function is perfect for this uh, scenario as well, because whether I'm getting one tweet or a million tweets, the function will scale up or scale down, and I only end up paying for the compute processing that I, I use to do that. So let's go see what that looks like. I'm going to come back up to my Explorer. I'm going to right click and say Add Folder to Workspace. And this is one of the new features of Visual Studio Code that just released in Stable uh, a couple of days ago. And I'm going to add this to the workspace, and this is something we call uh, multi root workspace. Workspaces. So now what we have is two top-level folders that we can work with together in one sort of group. And this is the function that um, runs whenever a tweet comes in. So what I'm going to do is come in here to index.js, and this is what happens. You know, we get the tweet in, we analyze the tweets, we call uh, Microsoft uh, the Azure Cognitive Services and use text analytics to analyze the text to generate the sentiment, and then we go and we save it back off to a graph in Cosmos DB. Now, Functions are awesome because they run up in the cloud and they scale out and everything, but they're also difficult to sort of debug. But with Azure serverless functions, what we can do is actually run them and debug them locally on our machine. So what I can do, just like we did with our app running locally, I can come in here, I'll put a breakpoint on line 11. I'm going to go to my debug view, and because we're in multi-root uh, mode right now, I can pick the, the, the target that will load up the function and press play. And what's going to happen at this point is we're going to load the Azure runtime, function runtime, on my machine. This is the same runtime, oops, uh, same runtime that runs up in the cloud. And what happens is whenever someone tweets about it, data changes in the cloud, but we break in our function locally on our machine. And so I said, whoops, because somebody already tweeted about it <laughs> and we broke on our, uh, on our function. But we can have a little bit more fun with that. So I'll press play. And so what I need everybody to do right now is take out your phones and tweet, I love pound smart hotel 360. And what will happen is once you do that, we will hit the breakpoint. Boom. So somebody tweeted about it. Thank you very much. And then we can sort of step and do all the great debugging experiences that we saw earlier. But again, this is all triggered off data that's changing up in the cloud, debugging locally on my machine. So what we can do now, once we're done with that, we can come back over to our workspace. I could right click, and then using the, uh, the Azure function application, I can deploy this up to the cloud, and then I'm happy to work with it. And so what we've seen here this morning is a great lightweight code editor. We've seen uh, hosting and publishing of Docker images to the cloud. We've seen a collaborative de development and debugging experience. We've seen uh, planet scalable data access. And we've seen functions that can run locally and in the cloud. It really is a great time to be a developer. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Great. Thanks, Chris and Amanda. So you know, some of the great, uh, one of the great capabilities that uh, Chris and Amanda showed off, uh, and you know, based on Twitter, which is exploding right now, it seemed to go over pretty well, uh, is this new cool feature that we're talking about called Visual Studio Live Share Support. We really think this is a game changer in terms of enabling real-time collaborative development. You know, VS Live Share enables you to not only work collaboratively on code, but to even do so when you're debugging apps uh, across multiple machines. And as you saw, it works not just between, say, VS Code sessions between two Macs uh, or between two Visual Studio sessions on Windows, but you can, in fact, have teams that are composed of multiple different parts of the Visual Studio family on multiple different operating systems, all developing simultaneously. And this works across Windows, it works across Mac, and it works across Linux development machines. And you can sign up uh, to join the VS Live Share preview starting today, and we really can't wait to get your feedback. So as I said at the beginning, you know, we now live in an intelligent edge, intelligent cloud world. And today, we're releasing a ton of other great new capabilities uh, that are really going to enable you to build amazing apps for this world. And for the rest of the keynote, I'm going to walk through just a couple of the key highlights uh, that we're releasing today. And then we have a whole bunch of more breakout sessions uh, throughout the rest of the day. We'll go even uh, into additional innovations that we're sharing as well. Uh, but let's start off this morning by talking about some of the great work that we're releasing in mobile. Now, you know, when you think about mobile development, you know, every successful mobile project 
requires at least three ingredients. You know, the first is you need to be able to build beautiful native apps uh, that perform well and use the best features and capabilities that are native to each device. You know, second, mobile developers need to be able to iterate quickly uh, and build sort of a continuous loop where you can build, test, distribute, and learn from your users uh, on an ongoing way. And then finally, every app needs to be backed by highly scalable cloud that can grow with your user base. Uh, and that provides intelligent services like data synchronization or AI capabilities that can make your app even more capable. And Visual Studio and Xamarin now provide an incredibly powerful solution that enables you to do all of this. Uh, and you know, since we've actually acquired uh, Xamarin at Microsoft uh, about 18 months ago, we've now have hundreds of thousands of developers around the world, including developers at some of the world's top brands now using VS and Xamarin to build amazing native mobile app experiences. And what I'd like to do is uh, invite James on stage here to show off what you can do now with VS and Xamarin and the amazing productivity that it delivers uh, and, allow, and how it allows you to target literally every single device. Here's James. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. I am truly humbled to be here with everyone to show you how we're taking C Sharp, Visual Studio, and Xamarin and making it the absolute best way to build apps on every single platform. And a lot of time it starts at the beginning, the installation process, the getting started. And we're optimizing that experience so you can install Visual Studio and Xamarin within five minutes and get your app on the device. But also, we want to enhance the debug cycle so you don't even have to compile your code to see it running live. Let me show you what that looks like. I've been building our smart hotel iOS and Android applications inside of Visual Studio. I have my shared code project up here on the right, and then my Android and iOS application. I'm going to use the brand new Xamarin Live Player right here on my iOS device that I've installed from the App Store. The Xamarin Live Player enables me to use our minimal installation or any installation of Visual Studio and Xamarin to debug and automatically iterate on my apps over Wi-Fi. So check this out. I'm going to go to Xamarin Live Player, Manage Devices, and simply pair it to Visual Studio. So I'll bring up the camera, just pair it to the QR code, and just like that, my iOS device is ready to deploy code. So what do I always do? Come in, tap Debug. Right here, I see all of my shared XAML. All the files are being transferred to my iOS device where the app is being interpreted. Nothing is compiled. But I'm in a real live debug session, so I can start using the app. So let's say James, and I'll say password. That seems secure. And what I've done here is not only saw my user interface, but I added a breakpoint to validate the sign-in. So when I hit sign in, I hit the breakpoint. I have all the locals, all the call stack, everything that I would expect all locally running on my device. Now, doing that with nothing more uh, than an iOS or Android device is awesome, but I also want to rapidly iterate on the design and my code. So why should I even have to compile? So let's go back over to the lo login view. I'm going to now use my favorite feature, feature of the Xamarin Live Player by right-clicking and saying Live Run. And immediately, the single screen of my application is redeployed. Now, this one looks pretty good, so let's toggle over to the home view. Immediately, as soon as I tap on that XAML file, it shows up on my device. But let's take a look at the menu view. It's looking not so great right now. I'm going to set down my iOS device here, and let's start modifying some XAML. So I should probably insert a header here, maybe give it some nice images. So I'm going to drag and drop over a XAML snippet. Now, I don't even have to save the file. It redeploys my changes immediately over to the device. But what's great is that it's not just doing user interface, it's also my source code. So if I come into the code behind where I'm initializing the menus, I only see a home menu. Let's flesh this out a little bit. So I'm going to come in, drag and drop over the rest of the menus. The Xamarin Live Player picks up all of my changes and redeploys. I never have to stop my development. It just automatically redeploys my code with an iOS or Android device. Now, I love the Xamarin Live Player, but I want to show you the full app experiences that you can build in C Sharp and Visual Studio. So what I'm going to do is hop over here. I have my iOS and Android device in hand, and I'm going to launch the finished version of the Smart Hotel application. And I'm going to dual wield here and attempt to book a hotel room 
both at the same time. We'll see if I can do it. So we have a beautiful, stunning application. I've logged in with my Microsoft account. I can find some information or swipe out, and I've logged in with Microsoft authentication, so it picks up my info. I'll hit uh, Book Room, and it automatically uses the device location to see I'm in New York and as it as a suggestion. So let's go ahead and tap through. Beautiful, stunning animations. I can maybe book for about a week or so. Here are all the hotels in the New York area. And again, I'm really getting this visually stunning application, parallax, everything I would expect. And I can simply book the room. And notice I'm getting the native iOS and Android user interfaces because it's a native application. So now once I'm logged in and I've actually booked my hotel room, I don't know about you, but I hate waiting in line. I get off the airplane, I get to the hotel. Why should I even have to wait to check in to my room? Well, we can use the power of these devices. For instance, Android has NFC. And what we've also done is not only built an application for smart uh, devices, but also kind of a digital door. So imagine this is a door right here, and Henry's over here super excited for us to check in. So I take it, I simply go ahead and tap, and on our NFC, it automatically detects that it's me, and now I'm in my room. So building multiple applications, but it doesn't stop there, because once I'm in my hotel room, the context switches. I want a beautiful desktop, tablet-type application. And that's why I'm here on Smart Hotels Surfaces. So immediately, I can come in. I can see some room temperature. I can get some rec recommendations for restaurants. It knows me, so it recommends me only coffee. Perfect. Um, I love it. I can also come back and do other things, though, such as um, start to go to my room, if I forget my toothbrush or I need towels or something, I can book it or even change the settings. So we can build these types of experiences across every single form factor and operating system. And what I want to do is show you a final Xamarin solution and what this application looks like. And notice that I said that we are developing a solution, multiple applications across multiple operating systems. Inside of here, I have my smart hotel client, Android, iOS, and Windows applications, my heads of the application. I have my smart door. I have my UI and unit tests inside of here and my ASP.NET Core backend systems. And everything is in here. The shared code is all of my business logic, models, view models, RESTful service calls, Azure integration, everything that is the same. And since we're using a shared XAML native user interface, all of my UI is here as well. Now, you may be saying, well, what does this look like to build applications in c -sharp for iOS and Android? Well, it's going to look exactly like that c -sharp code that you've been writing for years and you know and love. I come in, I create an HTTP client, I make RESTful service calls, I use JSON.NET to deserialize my JSON, all my NuGet packages, everything that I know and love. Now, if I need to, I can always come into any of the projects to access 100% of the APIs. So here's the card service where I'm binding to Android's NFC service. I have full code coverage, 100% of APIs in C Sharp. We're making it an absolute delightful experience to build applications inside of Visual Studio with C Sharp and Xamarin. Now, before I go away, there is one more thing I want to talk about which we know that a lot of developers and companies have investments in existing code bases. Those code bases may not be in C-sharp. They could be Objective-C, Swift, or Java applications. And it's kind of a shame that you can't start sharing code between those apps. But what if you could? What if you could take everything I showed you with C-sharp and .NET and use those libraries in Objective-C, Swift, or Java application? Well, you can, because today we're announcing .NET embedding enabling you to build native uh, libraries for iOS and Android with shared code. So I'm going to hop over to my Mac. It's a different application. I'm a big Kickstarter fan, and I love Kickstarter's open source iOS and Android apps, and that's what I have here. But they're written in Swift and Java. So I can't really contribute as a C-sharp.net developer, but as a Kickstarter backer myself and backing a few hundred projects, I've always thought of an idea of adding suggestions based on what I want. So when I go to my Kickstarter, of course, it recommends me, you know, I see all the coffee projects that I've searched for, but what am I going to do inside of the Swift? I don't know what's going on. I've got to go learn Swift. I've got to go re redo the user interface and the business logic twice. But with .NET embedding, I can simply come into Visual Studio. I'm going to create a shared code base, all of my business logic, models, view models, and shared user interface with XAML. Okay? So I've added a su suggestion screen that I can now embed in both iOS and Android. 
So I have an iOS and Android library. And down here, I have our .NET embedding NuGet package that I've installed. Now, what happens here is I compile my .NET library, send it through our .NET embedding embedinator tool, and what that does is generate an iOS framework or Android AAR file. So I hop back over to Xcode. If I scroll up to the top here, you can see I've brought in that shared framework that was generated from Visual Studio for Mac. If I scroll down, here's that shared suggestion view. I simply call into the shared code that I created and show the view. So I'll go ahead and do it. I'll tap on the suggestion view. And just like that, I'm now leveraging all of my C Sharp, .NET, and shared user interface on iOS, and I can also bring this to Android. We know that you're going to absolutely love it and build amazing things in C Sharp with Visual Studio. Thank you so much. Thanks, James. Great job. Uh, you know, James showed you how you can use Visual Studio as well as Visual Studio on the Mac. Uh, and how we can now enable kind of a really rich development environment that lets you build native apps that can run across iOS, Android, and Windows, uh, and share a lot of the same code across those while still allowing you to basically write directly to any native platform API uh, and build a fully native experience that's fully integrated. And with our, using our XAML standard, you can now build solutions with a consistent UI markup that works on iOS and Android and directly integrates with our universal Windows platform. And you know, James also showed off one of the great new capabilities that we're adding to Xamarin today, which is the ability to create these .NET projects that can natively compile down to a library that you can now reference from your existing Objective-C, Swift, and Java code. Uh, and this new .NET embedding capability really enables you now to easily start taking advantage of .NET and Xamarin uh, within existing large code bases you might already have for native mobile apps, uh, even if they were, were written not with Xamarin ever in mind, uh, and allows you to kind of start benefiting from the great productivity our tools and frameworks now provide. So you know, I've shown you how you can build beautiful native apps with Visual Studio and Xamarin. That was the first ingredient of those three things we talked about that are essential for building mobile apps. You know, the second ingredient that's essential is for you to be able to continuously iterate on your project once you get started. Uh, you want to be able to build, test, and distribute your apps continuously and monitor the performance and collect user analytics so you can improve the app quickly with each release. And doing this today you know, can often be complicated uh, because you have to glue together a wide variety of different scenarios and a whole bunch of different services to kind of make this all come to life. And to try to make this easier, we brought all these services together uh, to really help power your app uh, in one sort of core development experience, and we call it Visual Studio App Center. And Visual Studio App Center enables you to continuously optimize your app experiences and really delight your customers. And what I'd like to do is actually uh, talk, uh, show a video of a few of the customers that are taking advantage of it today and how it's really benefiting them. Let's roll the video. Quality, speed, and innovation is really at the core of what we do. We use Visual Studio App Center to enable our developers to move quickly. App Center enables us to monitor the crash reports. We're able then to both segment and group the crash reports to help us make decisions as to what we need to address before release, improve our overall code quality, and it helps improve the experience for the end user. So it lets us actually focus in on what's important. We want to reach as many users as possible across as many different devices as possible. The app was a collaboration with Envy in New Zealand. Each time that they'd release a new build, we'd get a notification through Visual Studio App Center, and then seamlessly we could click through, open the app, and view and test it at our end. That constant updates of the builds helped us get out to market really quickly. This is a game changer for us as a business. We have millions of mobile users using the native apps on each operating system. Visual Studio tools for Xamarin allowed us to develop and deploy an application to two completely different mobile phone ecosystems. Xamarin allows us to deliver customer features faster, and I can't wait to see what's next. 
It's really important that internally we move as fast as we can in order to evolve the product so it keeps getting better. Where Visual Studio App Center stood out was its reliability. We can write tests in one language, run them on a bunch of devices, and be able to rely on the test results. The ability to see our code running on real devices, that's the best way to reliably reproduce issues. Developers can spend much less time testing and more time focusing on developing new features and pushing out code. We've evaluated a bunch of solutions and I think this is really as good as it gets. And to help show off how easy it is to get started with Visual Studio App Center and some of the great things you can, it can do, I'd like to invite Samina and James back on stage. Oh, it feels real good to be back on stage, and I'm really honored to be with you, here with you, Samina. Hey, it's great to be here. So uh, I've been developing these smart hotel applications, and I know as a developer, developing is only half the challenge. I need to make sure I don't break the build, that I have high quality, and that I actually can get it into my users' hands and learn from that. Yeah. So I thought that I would do something different for Connect this year. Let's see. OK. I figured I'd give you a challenge. OK, tell me. So see if you could set up continuous integration on our iOS application in under 60 seconds. Of course. Challenge accepted. I will use the new Visual Studio App Center to get you all set up. I'm in App Center here, and on the dashboard are all the apps that our team has been working on. Yeah, so all of them we see iOS, Android, Windows, truly every single platform. Right. App Center supports apps written in Objective-C, Swift, Java, Xamarin, UWP, and React Native. Every developer, every language. Every language. Love it. So you said 60 seconds. Yep. Let me jump into the Smart Hotel iOS app and go right to the build service. First thing I need to do to set up a build is to connect to a Git repo. Our code is on GitHub, so I will go ahead and connect to it. Cool. And here's the repository, the Smart Hotel 360 for your Xamarin app. Once I'm connected to the repository, I can see all the branches that you and the team have been working on. Um, and once I see here the branches, I can quickly configure an App Center already knows. It knows here the solutions, it knows the project, it even knows the configuration. OK. You said it's an iOS app. Yep. So I'm selecting the solution here in the debug configuration, and that's it. Once I click Save and Build, a build will kick off right away with the latest changes that we've just pushed to the branch. So that's it. All the that's changes, it. everything done. All the changes. Awesome. So now, once I'm actually building the application, you know, I write pretty flawless code. Yeah. Usually, OK, sometimes. Every once in a while. But at the same time, I do have some challenges, which is that I want to make sure that I have great UI test coverage. So I've written a whole bunch of UI tests here. Can you App Center help out there? Of course. I ran all your UI tests on real devices hosted in the App Center device cloud. And they're right here. I know you wrote your test in C Sharp, but we could have used other frameworks, such as Espresso or XUI test. And things look really good. Your tests are green. Congrats. Your iOS users must be pretty happy. Yeah, so far, I'm assuming so. But I, you know, I'm an Android fanboy. I just can't help myself, let's be honest. And I know in that world, it's really crazy. There's a plethora of different devices and operating system. Can App Center run those too? Of course. I knew you would say that. App Center hosts thousands of real different devices with different OS versions and languages in our device cloud. And here they are. I knew you want your Android users to be happy as well. So I ran the same exact UI test across top 100 most popular Android devices. And here we can see the screenshots and how this app looks like on these real devices on the different screen sizes. And that's really amazing because there's no way that Scott will let me expense all of those devices. Probably not. I don't think so. But I see some red here. What is happening? What's going on? Let's see. There's a red test here. And if I go higher, oh. looks like your app is not always perfect. And your app has been crashing on an Android Oreo device. So truly time to expense a new app. No, uh, truly time to go and solve the problem. OK, so solve the source, fix some source code. But what I'm seeing here is that there's memory usage, mm -hmm. CPU usage, and logs. So truly, I get a whole bunch of all extra data. So even if I add some code, just because a test passed doesn't mean that the quality um, is 100%. So I can actually always check that. Yeah. Okay, so now that it's building and testing and it's a flawless, beautiful application, 
how do I get it on a device? I mean, in the past, I'd have to go run over to Scott's office and then go all the way back to Building 25 across campus. Campus, it's a mile away. It's so far. My poor legs can't go that far. Can App Center help out? Forget about running across the campus. Here in the distribution service, I have already distributed the app to alpha testers for internal alpha testing and to a pep, uh, beta testers group, which is our public extended beta testers. I know you, so you're an alpha tester. I can see your icon right here. And I have distributed the app to you. Oh, cool. So let's go ahead and see how it looks like on a device. All right, cool. So I'm distributed over here. And let's get our iOS device up there. Awesome. So I have a Hockey App installed here. And many of you may know about Hockey App as a way of distributing applications and services. And really, App Center is the evolution of that and a whole lot more. So I have the latest version here. So I'm going to launch Hockey App. Now, I've gone ahead and logged in with the same alpha tester account that Samina sent. But also, I'm on other teams and other apps that I'm testing. So we can see I'm all here. I'm going to tap on Smart Hotel 360. And what's really nice is that I can see all of the releases. In fact, it looks like there's one today. So let's go ahead and install that. And I'll go ahead and say Install. And now when I go back to my home screen, it's automatically installing the Smart Hotel 360 app, and I'm ready to start testing. Just like that. That's awesome. Awesome. Easy, right? Super easy. So once James installed the app, the testers are happy, Scott approves it, we can go one step further and publish this app to the public app store. And I can do this right here from the distribution service as well. That's it. Oh, cool. So all the way from just committing code, testing it, and then right into the App Store. I love it. Never have to leave Apps Center. Nope. Easy. Yeah. So now once they're out in the wild, you know, I like to gain insights into my applications. And in fact, you asked me to install the App Center SDK <laughs> into these apps. What has that been doing for me? So you've installed the App Center SDK, and the SDK has been collecting crashes and analytics data in the past few weeks. And here on this dashboard, I can see how many users have been using your app in the past 30 days. Oh, nice. Pretty good. How many times per day, and also for how long. And even more, I can see the top devices that your users have been using. So this helps me as a developer see what devices I should actually be testing against. Exactly. Very cool. Now, charts, graphs, they're pretty. But I'm a developer. I want access to the data and do stuff with it. Like, What can I do with the data? You can use all these insights and engage back to your users with push notifications. So let's take an example. I have here a country uh, graph, and I can see most of our users are from the United States. Got it. And we have here Thanksgiving only a few days away. So I'm sure that some of our users are still looking for a last minute deal to spend the holiday there. So let's send them a push notification with a secret deal we have. Awesome. Let's do it. Let's do it. Here in the push service, under audiences, I have already configured audiences based on the analytics data we gathered. So this data here, these kind of segments of audiences are coming from the data. So even exactly. version numbers, United States, even some events if they've logged in or not. That's exactly. really cool. They're all here. So I want to target the US users, because we it. have Thanksgiving, and send them a notification. Let's create a campaign called Connect. Whoops. And Put them a message, 20% off, not bad. Good deal. I will send a notification to around 2,000 users, which make 20% of our audience, including you. Oh, cool. So sending, sending. Sending. Boom. Oh, there it is, right there, actually on the device. Super cool. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. So there you have it, James. From start to finish. With App Center, we can quickly iterate when working on our apps, get insights from the users, and engage with them. Everything you need in the new Visual Studio App Center. Thank you so much. We know you're going to love it. <laughs> so as you saw with Visual Studio App Center, it allows you to continuously build, test, uh, monitor, and distribute your mobile apps. Uh, it works with any mobile app, no matter what language or IDE you use to develop it in, uh, whether it's built in Xamarin or Xcode or Android Studio. Uh, and I'm really excited to announce that we are releasing it today in general availability. Uh, you can sign up to use it for free. Uh, and we're really excited to see the great apps that we know you're going to be able to build with it. So you know, adopting container-based development uh, approaches using Docker is something that I know a lot of development teams are thinking about right now. You know, being able to deploy apps using Docker uh, enables a more consistent uh, deployment approach uh, and enables you to build solutions that can be deployed on any Docker-enabled system. 
And we now have great Docker and container-based development tooling support with Visual Studio and with .NET. And as you saw Chris demo earlier in this keynote, you, know, you can also now use VS Code to get a fantastic Docker and container-based tooling experience for any other language uh, as well. And where containers become even more powerful is when you start to take advantage of them across multiple parts of your solution and leverage a microservice-based approach to development. You know, for example, you might want to have your web app talk to multiple backend microservices uh, that you want to be able to deploy and use uh, containers with. And some of these microservices might even be written in multiple different programming languages uh, and owned by different parts of your development team. And we support inside Azure the ability uh, to run containers in multiple of our different platform services, including Azure App Service, which is what you saw Chris uh, take advantage of in his uh, demo earlier, uh, which is ideal for building web apps as well as uh, API backends, as well as our richer orchestration services like Azure Service Fabric, as well as our new Kubernetes-based Azure Container Service. You know, our new AKS uh, service inside Azure provides a fully managed Kubernetes-based orchestration service. It provides auto-patching, auto-scaling, and update support. Uh, enables you to really use the full breadth of the Kubernetes ecosystem when doing development. And it's going to be supported both in the cloud using Azure, as well as on-premises using Azure Stack. You know, Siemens is one of the companies that's using AKS on Azure today. Uh, as part of their healthcare solutions. And what I do is let's play a quick video of them talking about how they're leveraging it to really help transform their cloud-based development experiences. Let's watch the video. We see a change in the world that applies to healthcare. Digitalization and the networking between healthcare providers and software development companies is essential to value-based care. I love Kubernetes. We need to get faster in our development Stepping from the development of our own added value services into becoming a more and more of a platform provider, it is important for us to deconstruct into microservices and using Azure Container Service here is the right tool. The managed Azure and Kubernetes service puts us really into a position to not only deploy our business logic in Docker containers, including the orchestration, but it's also really easy through application gateway and API management to manage that exposure and control and meter the access continuously. With our cloud-based development approach, we have set an unprecedented speed within the company for product development. We're seeing a lot of workloads coming that are more occasional or need to be updated very often. Azure Functions are a very good mechanism to speed up and manage the functionality during daily operations. The key with serverless is really that you have a very short way from coding into actual operation of your code. I'm really proud of working for this project because it really can make a change to the healthcare industry. So containers are incredibly powerful and really change how you do microservice-based development. Uh, now, one of the things that we often hear from developers that are doing container-based development today, though, is that building with containers still isn't as fluid as they'd like. You know, compiling code, building containers, and deploying them, say, to a Kubernetes cluster today uh, isn't necessarily super fast. And ideally, what developers want is to be able to have the power of containers while also maintaining a great inner-loop development experience. One where you can edit and deploy your code instantaneously, uh, debug and set breakpoints across all your microservices, regardless of the language, uh, and seamlessly connect to a cloud-based environment uh, to be able to simulate during development what you're actually going to see during production. And what I'd like to do now is invite Scott Hanselman on stage uh, to show today some of the new VS Container tooling support that we're building uh, that's going to enable this super smooth inner loop development process with Kubernetes-based containers on Azure. Here's Scott. Cool. Hey, friends. So our uh, Hotel 360 booking site has these loyalty-based discounts. And there's a bug where the discount is not being applied. And I'm not going to spend 300 bucks a night to stay in New York. 
So I want to see how I can get my discount, right? Because I'm feeling entitled. Now, my team uses Kubernetes to manage that environment, and I'm going to connect to our cluster up using the new tooling for, for the Azure Container Service. And this is going to enable me to go and run all that stuff in Kubernetes in Azure. I'm going to switch over to where I think the bug is, which is here in, in Visual Studio, and the discount controller that I'm working on. And up here where it says IIS Express, rather than clicking IIS Express, I'm going to click this connected environment for the Azure Kubernetes service. I'm going to pick then my personal space up there in the cloud. And I'll hit OK. And then in Visual Studio itself, I'm going to right click and say Open Kubernetes Dashboard. Now, even though it says localhost up there, in fact, it's being proxied all the way through to Azure. Now, this is a really important thing to understand. If you look at that list on the left there, there is a list of the containers that are involved in this. The one that I'm worried about is discounts. But the app itself is made up of a large number of containers. And those containers are in different languages, written by different people in different locations. But this, this here isn't the complete holistic view of the app. There are other external dependencies. There's uh, Azure Cosmos DB that you can't see. There might be Azure AD. There might be a Redis service. But what is exciting about this is that this isn't representative of production. This is my development cluster. But it looks like production. It smells like production. It has all of those different things that make it work and behave like production. Why is that significant? It's significant because how much time have I spent trying to get my local underpowered laptop to look and smell like production? I've mocked out services. I've struggled to get all of the different containers running at the same time. In an attempt to make some simulacrum of production, why don't I just use Azure to do that and then collaborate as a team? So that's the general idea. So with Visual Studio's connected uh, tooling for, for Azure, it's going to make that inner loop easier. I want to be able to edit code, debug as fast as possible. So here in VS, I'm just going to put a breakpoint here, and I'm going to hit F5. Now, if you think about what's involved in building a container, pushing it to a container registry, bringing it back down, or maybe checking it into VSTS and then waiting for that build, I want an experience that feels like I'm on localhost, except I'm not. So I just hit F5, and all of that code just got built and deployed and pushed into Kubernetes in the cloud. And if you look at the URL here, I want to point out that that's not smarthotel360.com. That's the development cluster. Again, not production. Smells and behaves like production, but not localhost. So I'm gonna, I've hit that breakpoint, and I'm going to hit F10 and F10. And I'm going to call the profile service. I'm in the discounts service. It's going to then call the user profile and pass that ID in. And oops, it looks like I have an issue where I'm passing in a zero. I'm going to scroll up here. OK, so they called me with this ID, alpha key. That's a string. This is an int. That's a problem. So I've made a mistake. I'm going to go ahead and change that to a string. I will hit F5 again. And now I've got that nice inner loop. I didn't check this in to VSTS and wait for a build to see if it looked and smelled like production. Instead, I'm getting that feeling of confidence that my code is going to be OK because it's running in a production-like environment, except I just hit F5. So I'm getting confidence before I commit. So we'll go and check that out. And my code always runs exactly as it was written. I'm going to hit F10 and F10. We'll go and call profiles. And that's going to be amazing and work. Or not. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, 404. So that was a 404. That's bad. That means that there's a problem with the profile service, which is written by a different person in a different location in a different language on a different platform. So I'm going to pretend to be that person. I'm going to switch over to a Mac. Uh, and I'll put on my beret or whatever Mac users wear. And uh, so, so now I'm in Node on a Mac in VS Code in a different location. And, but I'm still talking to Kubernetes. If I go and run kube control, I can see the pods. I can see that stuff. I'm talking not again to local. I'm talking to the Kubernetes in the cloud. And I can see here my profiles route. You see, it's, it's still thinking about things in terms of an int. I'll just go ahead and remove that. And then I'm going to hit F5. On node, this was on .NET Core. Now I'm on node. We're going to synchronize that all up into the cloud. There'll be just a moment. Now we're in debug. I'll come over here, note the URL. Let's go ahead and reload. And now, to be clear, 
I'm hitting breakpoints in my Node app, but the breakpoint is in the container in the cloud amongst all the other containers, amongst all the other containers, giving me that feeling of confidence that this is going to work into production because that's as close as you can get without actually being in production. And I can even hover over it, and you see I've got locals and all the things. So it's a real debug session, except the power is in Azure. But it's as fast or faster than running locally. Yeah. That's hot. So that works. Let's go see if I get my money. There we go. I've got my money. So now I can maybe afford to stay in Jersey. That is the Kubernetes cluster that I'm running on with, again, different languages, different platforms, different team members. And it's encouraged that we're all working together like this with things like Live Share and with things like this new Visual Studio tooling for a AKS. You're going to enable F5 debugging with the confidence of production. And you're going to be able to have an experience that tests your app end to end, not just with other services in Kubernetes, but with other services within Azure. Thank you very much. So the connected environment support for Azure Container Service that Scott just showed off works with both VS as well as VS Code and will support all programming languages. And in addition to supporting Kubernetes on Azure Container Service, we're also going to enable the same experience with Service Fabric as well. And as you saw, it really delivers a fantastic inner loop development experience, one that can make you incredibly productive and at the same time allow you to take full power of uh, the amazing capabilities that container orchestration provides. Now, the cloud doesn't just bring new technologies and services. Uh, it also introduces new approaches that you can use to accelerate your delivery and the continuous improvement of your solutions. And DevOps is, is an approach that I'm sure all of you have heard of uh, and is one that when I talk to a lot of customers, everyone's looking to try to adopt uh, and, and, uh, inside their organizations. And you know, the, the hard thing about DevOps, though, is that setting up a DevOps pipeline you know, one that spans your build, test, and deployment environments, uh, that has integrated app analytics throughout it, uh, and which is really optimized for a team environment with the right uh, controls and the right uh, processes in place, you know, traditionally has not been easy. And it's required you to often manually integrate a lot of different tools and systems together. And what we're trying to do with Visual Studio Team Services is make it much easier to set up a DevOps-based model uh, and really set your team up for success as you're doing uh, cloud and, and uh, edge-connected development. VSTS is fully integrated inside uh, Azure and includes everything you need and works with every language as well as every runtime environment that you already use. Columbia Sportswear is a great example of just one company uh, that's taking advantage of Visual Studio Team Services today uh, to move to a DevOps-based model using Azure. And let's uh, watch a video of them telling their story. We're trying to think differently. We're trying to re-engineer ourselves. How do we innovate without a blank check? How do we innovate without having a dedicated team? Using methodologies like Agile and DevOps to make that possible. Our approach to DevOps was to get our developers productive on day one. We use Visual Studio Team services to ensure that we have good code quality, that we have good security standards in place, and that the pipeline is automated so that our developers can get their product to production quicker. Visual Studio Team Services was a great tool to support not only .NET, but also the Java development environments. We have both here. Data is at the heart of all of our applications. We are looking to make data available as data happens. Cosmos DB is the backbone to many of our mission-critical applications and services. We use a wide variety of open source tools, including Chef, Artifactory, Hubot, Grafana, we started with zero servers. We're now well over 1,500 in our version control system that are observable and people can understand how they've been built and configured. Microsoft made it really easy to break outside the silos. We're able to tie the DevOps process into the fulfillment of business process. Without the tools that we have today, we would not be successful. Columbia Sportswear is never done. We are constantly improving and we see areas that we can continue to improve in for the next 20, 30, 40 years.
And what I'd like to do now is invite Donovan Brown on stage to show off how you can get started with DevOps in Azure using Visual Studio Team Services. Here's Donovan. Thank you so much, Scott. For years, I've been sharing with you how you can use Visual Studio Team Services to implement DevOps in your organizations. But I've constantly been asked, but does it scale? So today, I'm going to share with you how we use Visual Studio Team Services to implement DevOps here at Microsoft. VSTS is planned, versioned, built, and deployed using VSTS. A team of over 500 engineers merging into master every day, producing over 600 pull requests, hundreds of builds, and running tens of thousands of unit tests, all the while deploying multiple times a day. Let's walk through a typical day of an engineer on one of the 50 feature teams that bring you VSTS every single day. The day begins in our team room, and on our Surface Hub is this dashboard. This is the roadmap to our success, the game plan for our sprint. I can customize it however I need to. It shows me what my team has committed to do, it shows me how many days are left in our sprint, and even shows me what work is currently assigned to me. Speaking of the work assigned to me, do you remember when your bugs were in one system, your requirements were in another system, and your tasks were in yet another system? Don't even ask about where our tests were. And by this awkward silence, I have a feeling that most of you still live in that world. But with VSTS, those days are behind us. Not only can I see everything from dev, ops, and QA in one place, on my product backlog, I can see it in priority order so that my team focuses on the most important things first. And as we grab that most important item, I have to share my status. If you're anything like me, you hate writing a status report. The only thing worse than writing one is reading one. But I always felt that that time was better spent adding value to my product. And that's why I love our Kanban board. Our Kanban board, it's like a, a real-time status report. At a glance, I can see what everyone on my team is working on. I can see if anything's lagging behind that needs our attention. And to update my status, I simply drag and drop. But this actually is where we build VSTS, so I'm just going to put this item back where it came from. Now, on the VSTS team, we actually use Git. And you know what that means? Branches, and lots of them. I used to create so many branches, I would forget why I created the branch. But when you actually create a branch from here on the Kanban board, you actually make an association between this branch and this work item. No matter how long I've been away, I know exactly why I created that branch. It doesn't stop there. Every commit to that branch, every build that is triggered, every release that is deployed is also associated with that work item. Think about that. That is full traceability. I can open up this work item and I can show you every line of code that was changed, every build that was run, every test that was executed, and what environment it is in simply by creating this branch. Now, all those branches eventually have to come together. And as you can see here, we can merge right here inside of our tool. But we don't just merge into master, we go through what we call a pull request. Now, I've been writing software for over 20 years. Some of you are smirking, but I'm much older than I look. The reason that I've written software for so long is because it's fun. And I want my pull request experience to also be fun. I want to communicate with my peers the same way I would on any social media. If an emoji or a meme is the best way to share your expression, you can do that. And if you see that one change of code, you know that change. That change that just gives you that warm and fuzzy feeling that you just know that was a hot piece of code, you can show it right here in your PR. Ooh, that feels so good. You know that code I'm talking about. But a pull request has to be more than just fun. A pull request has to be effective. It has to protect your master branch. So instead of me just writing emojis and using GIFs, what I'm also able to do is actually come in here and run builds, rerun an amazing 64,000 unit test against every single pull request. We do this over 600 times a day, making sure that master is solid. Our pull request experience is one of the best I've ever used. Now, the pull request is just the first gate that the code has to go through to get to production. After you survive a pull request, you then go through our CI system. Our CI system runs another battery of tests against your application. 
This is us constantly running tests against the builds that we're producing to make sure that we only ship the highest quality code to our end users. We want to take this value and we want to move it from the fingertips of our developers and put it into the hands of our users. And we do that practicing safe deployment. Safe deployment is where we deploy the code inside of an environment and we actually use the code in that environment. That first ring there, that is ring zero. That is where the VSTS team actually works. We dog food everything that we give to you. We make sure that it works for us before we ever force it upon you. We are monitoring telemetry. We're looking for any issues. And if and only if everything goes green, do we deploy it to the next ring, where we repeat this exact same process, monitoring telemetry and looking for issues. The telemetry that you monitor is crucial to your success. And that is where Application Insights comes in. Application Insights allows me to monitor not only my application, but the infrastructure upon which it runs. I can check my application for server errors, for response times. I can also check my infrastructure for security vulnerabilities and attacks. If anything needs my attention, I will be alerted right here on the dashboard. Imagine a time where I don't have to monitor this myself. Imagine a time where this information is automatically incorporated inside of my DevOps pipeline, where my pipeline can take action. Well, I'm really excited to tell you that that time, that time is now. Inside of release management, I can come in and I can configure a new feature, which is called gates. A gate allows me to use application insights to monitor my alerts. And should any of those alerts fire, the release will protect me from deploying code that should not be in the next environment. I can go further than that. I can actually have it run queries against my work items to see if any issues have been logged by my users during the use and deployment of my software. And if so, protect us by saying you do not want to deploy this yet. If that's not enough, I can even come in here and write an arbitrary Azure function or call a REST API to ensure my code is healthy before we push it to the next environment. And when everything goes green, we'll give you a signal that it's safe for you to deploy your code. Here we can see that we were struggling. Not all of our gates were correct. And release management said, now is not the time. Now is not the time. Now it's time. Everything is settled down, your application is safe, now you can safely deploy it into the next environment. We have automated safe deployment, taking what used to be manual and now allowing anyone to actually do this. So I've just given you a glimpse of what we do on the VSTS team. But if you're still questioning on if this can scale or not, we not only do this for us, we also do it for Windows. 25,000 engineers working on a single code base use VSTS every single day. So does it scale? Oh boy, yeah, it scales. If we can handle Windows, we can handle you as well. Now the next question is, Donovan, all amazing. Sign me up, I'll take it. But how do I get started? I don't know anything about .NET, because I'm assuming you're window Microsoft, so it has to be .NET on Windows, right? And I don't know anything about DevOps. This is the first time I've heard of it. I'm pretty good with Azure, but I've never even seen VSTS before. So how do I go about building this? Well, you start with Azure. We have a new getting started experience in Azure that allows you to use whatever language that you want. And we'll even create a VSTS account for you. And you can tell that this, <laughs> this is not your daddy's Microsoft. PHP, Java, and Node. And we know we want, you want to run your Java in a container. You want to run your Node on Linux. And if you want to build the mobile app that James showed you, you got to build that on a Mac. We are with you every step of the way. This is not just a new era for Microsoft. This is a new era for all of us. Because when we combine the power of Azure and Visual Studio Team Services, we empower everyone using any language and targeting any platform. Let me show you how it works. Let's go ahead and choose Java, because I know you don't believe me. I'm going to go ahead and click on Next. I get to choose whatever framework that I want. And then I get to choose what infrastructure upon which I want to run my application. Let's go ahead and do containers. We've been talking about that all day. If you do not have a VSTS account, we will create one for you. But I happen to have one. Actually, I happen to have plenty of them. So I'm going to go ahead and choose one of my existing accounts. And now all I have to do is give my project a name. So we're going to call it Smart Hotel 360 and simply click on Done. Now I sit back and I relax. I simply wait for Visual Studio Team Services and Azure to work together to build an entire DevOps pipeline for me. What's going to happen at the end is if I click on this, you're going to see that right here, I have a dashboard inside of Azure that gives me access to the commits I have inside of VSTS, the builds that have run, the release that has actually run. And if you'll notice, I also have access to my resources here in Azure. And at the bottom, 
this Java app running in a container is already sending us custom telemetry into application insights. We are putting you well on your way to building the same pipeline I showed you before. We have never made it easier for you to rub a little DevOps on it and make it better. So what I want you to remember is that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. So when you go back to work on Monday, do not try to convince the others. Do not ask for permission. You just go do the right thing for your company. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Donovan. So as Donovan showed in that demo, it's now easier than ever to really set up a DevOps model using Azure and take advantage of, of a DevOps system that's going to scale whether you have one or two developers working on a project or 25,000 of them. And using the new Azure DevOps project support that we're releasing today, you can now set up a CI-CD pipeline with a full application monitoring support for .NET, Java, Node.js, Python, and PHP, literally in just a few clicks. Uh, it supports Git-based source control uh, repositories, both in Visual Studio Team Services, and you can also even point to existing source control repositories you have on GitHub today and still set up a CI-CD pipeline uh, completely for it. And best of all, you get started with it completely for free. Uh, and we include free build hours every month that you can take advantage of um, as part of your solution. So let's now switch gears and talk a little bit about data. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, we released SQL Server 2017. Uh, SQL Server 2017 is the fastest, most secure, and most intelligent database on the planet, and now provides ultimate flexibility. Uh, we released SQL Server 2017 simultaneously on Windows Server, uh, Linux, as well as Docker-based container systems, and it delivers unparalleled performance with our new adaptive query processing engine, making it the fastest release of a database ever. And this enables you to now also use machine learning tools and models that can be built in R and Python that you can now run directly against the in-memory database support that it includes, enabling you to add, uh, make your apps more intelligent than ever as well. And one of the things that you know, makes SQL Server unique is the fact that it's really the only data platform out there today that's available both on-premises uh, as well as a fully managed database service in the cloud using Azure. And what this means is you can take advantage of all of that SQL Server functionality everywhere and get the best possible experience when use it, using it as a fully managed service uh, in the cloud using Azure. You can stand up a new SQL database in Azure in just about 60 seconds and have it be highly available, durable, secure, and fault tolerant without you having to configure anything. Azure provides built-in backup and point-in-time restore capabilities. Uh, automatic performance tuning support, and security threat detection capabilities that enable you to lock down your systems even further. And best of all, you get all of these different capabilities without having to manage virtual machines or worry about patching or having to tune your infrastructure manually. Our SQL database service offering takes care of all of that for you. Uh, Thomson Reuters is uh, just one of the companies that are building their products on top of Azure and using our Azure SQL database today. Uh, let's watch a video of them telling the story. What we were tasked with was to build a highly extensible, scalable system. Challenges like this are what we live for as developers. eBilling Hub is an automated eBilling solution developed primarily for law firms to automate their billing cycles. Our ecosystem for eBilling was growing at an alarming rate. We transact about 4.5 million invoices per year. So we decided to move eBilling Hub to the Azure cloud. Migration to SQL Azure was seamless. We were able to scale up the database on demand and share our workloads across multiple subsystems. The invoicing system deals with highly complex invoice data, a very complex set of rules. If there's any untimely processing of this data, then people aren't getting paid. We developed a pure pass solution, leveraging Azure artifacts such as storage queues, SQL and NoSQL storage. We use machine learning to analyze the data that we're gathering to gain insight into our market behavior. The benefits we saw from the Azure migration was almost immediate. Managed Azure SQL services have been an instrumental part of our success. We were able to process about 74 validations per second. And in one instance, the billing guideline validation was able to validate 28,000 invoices in less than two hours, which would normally take about two days. One of the biggest business values is the ability to go downstream and target the 27,000 Thomson Reuters customers who are yet to avail the e-billing service. 
My team and I are really excited to be part of this transformational journey that's changing the landscape and also helping us grow the business. And what I'd like to do now is invite Laura on stage to show off Azure SQL Database in action and how you can take advantage of it. Here's Laura. Thanks, Scott. So you're developing a new application, and you've asked your IT department for a new database. How long before you can start using it? Is it hours? Is it days? I've waited weeks. I have waited weeks. Well, the great news is that with Azure, you can have the most intelligent database on the planet in less than a minute. We'll just connect to Azure, and either programmatically, and we're going to connect in the portal, and select the new Azure SQL database. Give your database a name. Choose a server and a region. It's available in every region in Azure. And then choose the level of resources you want to give your, your database. You can change your mind at any time in the future, increase and decrease computes without any database downtime. And that's it. From here, we'll just click Create. And we're now connecting to Azure through the management API, and it's provisioning a new database as a service. This is not a virtual machine. I don't need to manage any infrastructure. Azure takes care of all of that for me. Right now, it's standing up three redundant servers, so I have high availability if a server or a disk goes down. It's wiring up DNS. It's encrypting my disk by default, enabling transparent data encryption. It's also setting up a number of additional features like backup, point-in-time restore, threat detection, and, and many other features. And this is running the latest version of SQL Server. In fact, we've been running SQL Server 2017 in the service for over a year. That means I have access to the most modern database features available. You have to admit, this is impressive. In much less than a minute, I have access to the industry-leading SQL Server delivered as a service. I don't have to manage any infrastructure, and I have access to all the latest modern features. Now, because this is SQL Server, I can also connect to it with all of my common tools I'm, used to, uh, I'm familiar with, things like Visual Studio, SQL Server Management Studio. Now, many of you, like I am today, are using a Mac as your primary development environment. Today, we invite you to download the new SQL Operations Studio. This is a free cross-platform database development and management tool, and it runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac environments. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? You can set up your own custom dashboard so you can monitor your SQL Server assets. In fact, I can connect to any SQL Server on-prem or in the cloud. Now, because this is based on Visual Studio Code, I get all that same rich development experience that you'd expect. You can see the rich text development. Whoops. Including IntelliSense. Now, we're also coupling that rich developer experience with the, uh, with the experience that you need when you're doing uh, database development. And that includes those rich uh, uh, explain plans so that you can go in and debug your code and understand and optimize how you're designing your code and indexes in SQL Server. Now, speaking of database code, I've often released, and I'm sure you've had that experience to release updates, and sometimes it degrades performance. I mentioned earlier that this is the most intelligent database on the planet. Coming back out to Azure, we're going to connect to an existing database. And in the portal, if I scroll down, I have access to a full range of performance insights. Azure is continuously monitoring the query activity and producing reports of the top queries that are consuming resources. I can identify those top queries and drill into those queries and improve those uh, performance issues. In fact, Azure continuously monitors all of my database activity. It's using machine learning 
on my database workload to understand where to improve performance and providing recommendations on those improvements. I can take these improvements and I can uh, select the scripts that Azure gives me. I can apply them directly on my database using Operation Studio, Management Studio. I can also let Azure apply these directly for me, automatically apply them. Azure can auto-tune auto my database. That's intelligence. Now, Azure includes a number of features that give me uh, confidence in the performance in the security and the availability of my database. Azure is the only cloud that provides this complete database as a service. I'm going to hand it back to Scott. Thanks. So one of the great new tools that Lara demoed was our new SQL Operation Studio. You know, it's a free tool. Uh, for modern database operations and support SQL Server, SQL databases, and our Azure SQL Data Warehouse service. And it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux machines, uh, allowing you to use it everywhere. And I'm really excited to announce it's available to start downloading and using today. We also have a new Azure Data Migration service that will make it even easier to migrate your existing databases to use our new Azure SQL Database as a service that Laura just showed. Uh, the data migration service streamlines moving existing database systems to Azure and provides a fully automated workflow to do so, both for existing SQL Server databases as well as for non-Microsoft database systems and platforms as well, including Oracle database uh, as well. And the new data, mi data migration service, um, combined with new capabilities that we're adding to our SQL database uh, offering this year, is going to make it trivially easy to migrate literally any SQL Server database uh, to run inside the cloud without having to change any code in your applications and have a seamless near zero downtime migration experience and be able to take advantage of all those amazing productivity capabilities uh, that Laura just demoed. And what I'd like to do is hand it back to Laura to actually show off migrating a real SQL database uh, into the cloud using our SQL database service and data migration wizard. Here's Laura. Thanks, Scott. All right, so many of you have applications and they're powered by SQL Server. Um, and there are a class of, and you want to modernize these applications and move them to the cloud. But many of these applications have complex data requirements. Things like, they, they, they require things like cross database joins or SQL agent or CLR. Well, the great news is that all of these are now going to be supported in the uh, Azure SQL DB managed instance that will be coming soon. I'm going to show you how this works with the database migration service and move an existing application up to the cloud. So I've got Stack Overflow, and this is running locally on my laptop. And this is connecting to uh, uh, two databases. And if we scroll down, you can see that it's connected to two databases that are hosted on SQL Server 2008R2. The application requires cross-database joins to render these views. And because of that, in the past, I haven't been able to take advantage of the PaaS database service. Well, I'd like to migrate this to the new Azure SQL DB managed instance, and we're going to do that using the database migration service that Scott just spoke about. This is a very easy-to-use tool. It's very intuitive. You start by giving it the name of your source database. In my case, it's a SQL Server 2008R2 environment running in my data center, and uh, we're connected to that now. Next, we point it to this, the destination. This is my Azure SQL DB managed instance, and I created that earlier this morning. Now, this uh, supports other sources. It can support Oracle, MySQL, as well as any supported version of SQL Server. I, connect to the two I selected two databases. As I mentioned, I require cross-database joins. There are two databases for my application. We're going to select both databases to be migrated. And finally, I, I need a temporary storage location. Uh, the service is going to use this during the migration as it's migrating the uh, database objects up to the cloud. So we'll just wait for this to do validation, and that's it. So from here, we'll just give our project a name and run migration, and we're connecting to the cloud. So right now, the service is backing up the databases on my source. It's moving those backups and migrating them to the cloud. 
This is a very uh, intelligent service. It supports multiple scale models. It can support everything from megabyte-sized databases all the way up to multi-terabyte-sized databases, all with minimal downtime. In the project, if we click Refresh, we can see that just in a few seconds, we've already completed our migration, and our databases are now modernized into a PaaS database service in the cloud. That was pretty quick. We're going to go back to our application. So I've got my application, and if we come out here, um, I'm going to change my connection string. And I'm just going to point it now to my Azure SQL DB managed instance that we just migrated. And we're going to run this locally and reconnect it. I made no changes to my application. All I did was change my connection string. If we scroll down, you can see that we're connected to Azure SQL DB Managed Instance. That's pretty impressive. So in just a couple of minutes, we were able to modernize our database environment. We've migrated up to the cloud. And now we have all the advantages of scale, performance, management, and that advanced intelligence that you only get when you run SQL Server in Azure. I'm going to hand it back to Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. I'm excited to announce that the Azure data migration service that Laura just demoed uh, is now available in public preview. And you can start using it today to start easily migrating uh, your SQL databases to the cloud uh, faster than ever before. Now, in addition to our SQL database as a service offering, we also now have fully managed uh, service offerings for MySQL and Postgres as well. Uh, you can use them to stand up a new MySQL or Postgres database in Azure in 60 seconds, just like you saw Laura do with SQL Server. Uh, and they have high availability and security built in, and we automatically patch and update them for you. And unlike other cloud providers, we also enable you to elastically scale up or down the performance of all of our managed services with zero application downtime. And best of all, they're 100% compatible with all existing MySQL and Postgres tools, drivers, and frameworks. And I'm excited today to announce that we're also adding another relational database uh, as a service option to Azure, which is our new Azure database for MariaDB. Like our Postgres and MySQL options, it's 100% compatible with all existing drivers, libraries, and tools, and enables you to take full advantage of the rich MariaDB ecosystem. And in addition to launching the new MariaDB service on Azure, I'm also excited to announce that Microsoft is today joining the MariaDB Foundation. Uh, and here's a uh, video of uh, Monty Wadenius, who is the founder of MariaDB, talking about the MariaDB ecosystem and the new service we're launching on Azure. Hello, developers everywhere. I'm sorry that I can't be that person. At least you got me a bit virtually. And I'm really happy to have Microsoft joining the MariaDB Foundation as a platinum sponsor. I've been working on the MariaDB MySQL code since 1981. In 1996, we released it open source. When you spent 30 years working on the same product, improving it from day to day, it becomes like a virtual child and something that you need to take care of. Part of me taking care of my products is I have named them after my children, my squirrel after me, my oldest daughter, and Maria after my youngest daughter. What people don't understand when you are a coder, it becomes like a music. You can see patterns and you see right code is something that is, looks beautiful on the screen. One of the main reasons MariaDB has been successful is that I have been able to have the same team who created MySQL with me to work on MariaDB. We also have had great help from the open source community and especially distributions to make MariaDB popular. I'm excited to work together with Microsoft on making MariaDB a first-class database service on Azure. I'm really happy to see Microsoft joining the foundation with the intent of collaboration and working together with us closely to make MariaDB better. And I welcome Microsoft to the MariaDB family. This is Finland logging out. Have a really, really great time at Connect. Goodbye from Finland. Earlier this year, we also released our Azure Cosmos DB service, which is the first globally distributed multi-model NoSQL database service that delivers horizontal scale with guaranteed single-digit millisecond latency. 
uh, and it enables you to build truly amazing cloud solutions. You know, imagine a horizontally scaled database that puts data everywhere that your users are. You know, with Cosmos DB, we've built a database service that does just that and can automatically replicate data to any Azure region around the world to give your users lightning fast performance wherever they're accessing your application. Cosmos DB also enables you to elastically scale your storage and performance throughput across one or multiple Azure regions with zero application downtime. You can start with just a few gigabytes of data and scale to manage petabytes of it. And you can start processing, let's say, a couple hundred requests per second and scale up to running tens of millions of requests per second simultaneously against your data everywhere around the world. And best of all, Cosmos, with Cosmos DB, you only pay for the storage and performance throughput that you provision, making it incredibly cost effective. And Cosmos DB is the only database out there with comprehensive SLAs across availability, data consistency, and performance. Uh, Cosmos DB, in fact, guarantees single digit millisecond response time at the 99th percentile as one of the SLAs. And you can directly monitor this and all the other SLAs from within the Azure management portal. And Cosmos DB is unique in that it allows you to program against it using a variety of different NoSQL APIs and data models. Uh, we support MongoDB, uh, Gremlin Graph, Table APIs, SQL APIs, as well as Spark APIs. And I'm really excited to announce today that we're extending our Cosmos DB API support even further by also adding Cassandra API support and data model semantics. This gives you now, starting today, the ability to use Cosmos DB as a Cassandra service and take advantage of the global scale, data distribution, and fantastic performance characteristics that Cosmos DB provides. And we're incredibly excited to see what you build with it. Let's switch gears now and talk also about how not only can you store data and use it really responsively, but also use it to develop breakthrough intelligent apps uh, using AI. Now, Azure provides a comprehensive set of data and AI services that enable you to really build transformational solutions. Uh, these services include, for example, our new Azure Machine Learning Service, which makes it easy to train and operationalize AI models, as well as our Azure Cognitive Services that provide pre-built AI APIs uh, that you can call to perform scenarios like vision detection or sentiment analysis or audio transcription and more. Uh, in fact, we have a, a great uh, breakout or a keynote right after this one where we're going to go deeper into some of those services and how you can take advantage of them, even if you're not a data uh, analyst or AI expert. And today, I'm super excited to announce another great service that we're bringing to and uh, launching on Azure, which is our new Azure Databricks offering. Uh, Azure Databricks is a Apache Spark-based analytics service optimized for Azure. It allows you to quickly launch and scale up Spark services uh, inside the cloud on Azure. Uh, it includes an incredibly rich interactive workspace that makes it easy to build Spark-based workflows. And it integrates deeply across all of our other Azure services, including Azure Active Directory, our SQL Data Warehouse, Cosmos DB, Power BI, and Azure Machine Learning, giving you an incredibly powerful way to integrate Spark deeply across your apps and drive uh, richer intelligence from it. And Azure um, Databricks, uh, is a first-party Microsoft offering, meaning you can use it just like any other Azure service. You just go to the portal, click New, it goes on your Azure bill, just like you'd expect. Uh, but we built it together with the Databricks team, uh, who are the creators of Spark, and they've been deeply driving the development of this service, and they've just done a phenomenal job building a truly remarkable service uh, that I think you're gonna really love. And what I'd like to do is invite Ali, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Databricks, and Greg Owen, uh, a software developer for Databricks, on stage to talk about it and show it off. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Scott. Thank you so much. We're so excited about this. We've heard overwhelming demand from a customer base. They want Azure. They want the security. They want the compliance. And they want the scalability of Azure. And they've been asking for a long time about this. And at Databricks, we're really focused on building a platform it's really easy to use, it's really fast, and it especially focuses on collaboration to make data scientists, data engineers, analysts collaborate and be more productive together. So we're super excited to join forces here and build this first party service together. Uh, we think it can be a game changer. It's a natively integrated, optimized service. And we think that it can really make big data and AI much, much more simpler. I could talk all day about this, but I want you to actually see the demo live by Greg Owen. So thank you so much. Great, thanks. thanks. Thank you.
Thanks, Scott and Ali. Hi there, everybody. My name is Greg Owen, and I'm a software engineer at Databricks. So, so far today, we've heard a lot about how developers at Smart Hotels 360 can build and deploy their different apps on Azure. What I'd like to talk to you about is how they can also build and deploy their data pipeline, which will allow them to optimize their most important metric of revenue, their hotel room occupancy rate. And we're going to do this today using Microsoft Azure Databricks, the fastest, easiest, and most collaborative Apache Spark platform for Azure, the most compliant and trusted cloud. Let's dive right in. Here you can see that I'm in the Azure portal, and I have access to this shiny new Azure Databricks service, where in just a few clicks and filling out a few fields, I can launch a new Azure Databricks workspace. This will allow me to have a fully functioning Apache Spark cluster up and running in as little as two minutes, so I can very quickly dive into my data. It'll also pass through all of my information and configuration from Azure Active Directory, meaning I don't have to waste any time reconfiguring all of my security settings. It just works right there. But I've already got an Azure Databricks workspace set up, so let's dive right in here. Here's the workspace, and I'm going to open up our file browser so that we can see all the different steps in the pipeline that we're going to build for you in the next five minutes. But before we dive into the pipeline itself, let's take a step back and, like any good developer, think about what the end goal of this pipeline is. Right, so the hotels industry pulls in about $500 billion in revenue each year, and it is a fiercely competitive industry. For a successful hotel, room occupancy rates might be anywhere between the mid-70% to the high 70%, but for an unsuccessful hotel, they can be as low as 60%. It's a pretty tight range, and so even increasing our occupancy rate by just a little bit can drive a massive amount of revenue and make our business much more successful. So we're going to build a pipeline today that will increase that revenue, increase that occupancy rate by providing offers of experiences that we can provide to our potential customers to entice them to come and stay at our hotel rather than our competitors. We're going to start with data engineering. Here, I'm in a notebook, and a notebook is just a collection of different cells of code that I can run independently and get interactive feedback from, with results here. This is a very popular way for developers and data scientists to set up data pipelines. We're going to start with some existing data that we already have in Azure SQL Data Warehouse. This is structured data about past reservations at our hotel. We see who made the reservation and what kind of room they paid for. And this is going to help us target different events to these different people, but it's not quite enough information, right? We still don't know much about these different potential customers. And so we've also pulled in a truly massive demographic data set from our Azure Blob Storage. And what this will allow us to do is segment the population into different groups of people that we can target different events to. So for example, maybe we'll have one group of people who are married with kids, and we're going to want to send them to, you know, offer them a discount on a children's museum rather than sending them to a rock concert. And then maybe we have a different group of people who are single and perhaps have more disposable income to spend, and so we're probably going to want to send them an offer for like a nicer dinner rather than the children's museum discount. And because there are so many different types of people in the world, this is truly massive data. We're talking hundreds of millions of rows. But with the full power of Apache Spark on Azure Databricks, we can chew through it in just a few seconds with no problem. All right, now we've got all this information about the people, but that doesn't really matter unless we also have events to recommend them. And so we've also gone and pulled in some unstructured data into our Azure Data Lake. This is just from scraping different event provider websites from around New York, say concert venues or theaters. We get this kind of unstructured blob, but with the full power of Spark, we can quickly and easily parse this unstructured data into structured data so that we can join it with that other data and feed it back into our model. Let's go look at the model itself. I'm going to open up another notebook, and you can see that I'm still using the same set of tools and the same set of languages as my data engineer, all within the same environment. In this case, we're using Python, because that's what our data scientist likes to use. But you can also use R, SQL, and Scala on Azure Databricks. And now, I have to confess something here. I'm not really a data scientist, so I didn't build this notebook. My friend Barack, who we can see is currently viewing it, did. And he's also left us some comments to tell us how to run this notebook and what we're doing here. And so reading from Barack, first he says that we're going to be using Parquet to process this massive data much more quickly. We're going to start building our model. We take in here this, all of this data from this demographic data set. Then we create a pipeline uh, doing some logistic regression to determine what kind of recommendations we should make. And here he says that we should probably fit this model using cross-validation. Sounds like a good idea. So I'm just going to select all this code uncomment it, and now I can pull in this off-the-shelf cross-validator that MLlib provides us right out of the box. We don't have to reinvent any wheels here. All of this process, which used to take maybe weeks or even months on another platform, we can now do in minutes or days on Azure Databricks. 
So let's see what kind of recommendations we're getting. Remember, the output of this model is a set of packages that we want to give to a particular user. So what user are we going to use to test it? Well, we came up with a user who is perhaps a male, born in the 1970s, maybe fond of wearing red shirts on stage. Uh, we've created a Scott Guthrie clone, and let's see what we recommend for Scott. We've got a red polo shirt sale at a local retailer, some dinner options, uh, and Scott, I didn't realize that you were a hockey fan, but we've got some Canucks tickets that we think that you're going to love. You should really come stay with us. So now that we've got all this data, we know that we can have these models, we can also write it out to any of the other Azure data services that we're already using, whether that's Azure Cosmos DB or Azure SQL DB. And this way, we can serve these recommendations not only in potential emails that we send to customers, but also across all of our other web and mobile properties. But we're not done yet, because now we're just sending this model out. What we really want to know is how good is this model. We want to close that feedback loop to understand how users are responding. And in a typical system today, what you'd have to do is maybe take a batch information over the past weeks of data, process that batch, and then get a single report each week. But this means that as soon as you have that information, it's already stale. It's at least a week out of date. And that's no good. It doesn't allow us to be nimble and respond to things in real time. And so what we're going to do is go to this other notebook here, where we're going to set up a real-time streaming dashboard. And for anybody out there who's had to do this on their own, this is an extremely difficult process in most cases. There's a lot of overhead, a lot of different things to get right. But with Azure Databricks, we provide full support out for it right out of the box. And here you can see we're reading in that static data that we showed before about all of our past reservations and effortlessly joining it with an incoming stream of data that is coming in from every time that a user clicks through an email. And so what we get is a real-time output that updates as users click through, and we can see where in the United States all of these click-throughs are coming from. And of course, since we're in New York, we're seeing a lot of click-throughs from New York and New Jersey, but this is Microsoft Connect, so we're also seeing some good representation from Washington State and from California. Finally, let's say that this hadn't worked on the first try and that we would had to do some debugging. Azure Databricks provides really easy access to metadata on how this stream is performing in real time. Without having to do any extra configuration on our own, we can immediately see how quickly we're pulling in data and maybe diagnose a problem that way. But this data isn't just constrained to the Azure Databricks platform itself. Because we're working in Azure and we're fully integrated with the rest of the Azure data estate, we can write all of this information back to our Azure SQL Data Warehouse or whatever other location we want and read it in from another tool like Power BI. And so here I've had one of our business analysts go ahead and create a Power BI notebook based on that data. And we have analysis of our conversion rate and even break out our revenue by different types of event packages so we can track at a very high level how effective this pipeline is. So to recap, in the past five minutes, what we've done is we've taken a massive data set and curated it using data engineering. We've then collaboratively created a sophisticated model on top of that data using data science, and finally closed our feedback loop with a real-time streaming analytics dashboard that will tell us exactly how users are responding to these offers. All of this would have been very difficult, if not impossible, before today, but now it's easy using Azure Databricks. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Greg. Awesome. Thanks. And I'm really excited to announce that the Azure Databricks offering you just saw is now available in preview. Uh, it's going to enable you to deeply leverage Spark and build amazing AI analytic workflows with Azure and add even deeper intelligence into all of your applications. So we now, as I said at the beginning, live in an interconnected world, uh, one where you want to be able to take advantage of intelligent edges and be able to take advantage of an intelligent cloud. And as you've seen, hopefully, throughout this keynote, uh, we're delivering a whole bunch of great capabilities uh, that enable you to take advantage of the latest in these technologies in a really rich way. You know, the combination of the Visual Studio family of tools and Azure delivers an amazingly rich set of services and capabilities that enable you to build apps that can be written in any programming language, use any operating system, target any device, save any type of data, be able to get rich intelligence off of that data, and scale to run literally all over the world. And you, know, you can get started by downloading the, all of our tools for free. Uh, we now have free versions pretty, of all of the services and tools that you saw today. Uh, and you can also now sign up to Azure, not only for free and get $200 of credits, 
but we also now provide a year of free services even after the trial ends so that you can run a Windows or Linux VM, spin up a SQL database, or run a Cosmos DB database at no charge for a year after your trial starts. Uh, and we really think as you start learning to take advantage of these great capabilities, you're going to be able to make and build truly amazing applications and solutions. You know, Microsoft started more than 40 years ago as a company that built tools and solutions for developers, and developers remain very much at the core of our DNA. You know, I hope you enjoy the rest of today's content. Uh, we're really looking forward to getting your feedback on all the new services and tools that we released today, and I can't wait to see the great applications I know you'll build with it. Thanks so much and have a great rest of the day. Developers want to be in the zone. Anything that gets you an answer without taking you out of that zone is powerful. The promise of Stack Overflow's bot built with Microsoft AI is to keep developers in the zone while they're working on their code. By bringing in tools like Microsoft's advanced AI technologies and cognitive services and making them so accessible to developers through the Azure platform helps every developer out there making sure you have the right information at the right time. Everything we do is very much about matching and about predicting. We use machine learning to help figure out what people are looking for so that we can answer their questions. With this bot, you can integrate that into the development environment so that developers can immediately get the answer to their question. By making these tools readily available through Azure Machine Learning, I think that Microsoft is doing the data science community a great service. Stack Overflow has been working on our talent business for about six or seven years now, matching the right developer to the right company. With tools like advanced AI capabilities, we can take our matching to the next level. It's all about helping developers get things done faster. Stack Overflow is only as good as our community makes it. We build the tools, but the community is contributing all the intelligence. We couldn't do it without the community. Yeah.